Hey everybody, welcome to Dead Reckoning TV Season 5. We're kicking off an all new Above the Pay Grade with Ryan Anderson, William E. Simon Fellow at the Heritage Foundation. Very excited to have you on with us, Ryan. Thanks, glad to be with you. I'm Jay Friesen. And I'm Brian Matson. And uh, Ryan, you know, you you have um, a lot to say. I mean, you can you can just hit people with with the facts, with the details, and just and just hit them hard. And I find it somewhat a little bit um, uh, sneaky that you're this sneaky. really sometimes this hard hitting guy with the fat. You know, you got all the details, and then like your Twitter profile is this: you're sitting here with a beer in your hand, <laughs> kind of just hanging. You're like, oh, this guy's super chill and relaxed. He's uh -uh. The, he's Not until you get him talking about marriage or something. He's the king of cool. What uh, What is your preferred What is your preferred flavor of uh, the brew? I like Guinness. Oh, I nice. like stouts in general. Classic stouts in general. Oh, Classic. Yeah, pulled yeah. on nitro. I, I actually don't classify Ryan a Guinness as a, as a stout though. It's so no. light. You know, that's like drinking <laughs> water. It's delicious. <laughs> <laughs> Flavored water. How, how about old Rasputin then? I've never had it. You know, actually, actually that's not oh, bad. I'll drink Old Rasputin is all day. quite good. Yes, all right, good, quite yeah. good. Stouts are stouts easily, are really great. Easily. So, in the midst of yeah. all this beer drinking, um, <laughs> Ryan, we Ryan have a is lot a, of discussion. Uh, Ryan's a premier uh, articulate defender. He's the premier exactly. articulate defender of traditional marriage. Um, Ryan, I notice uh, you, you speak all over the country. You do a lot of media appearances, some of them infamous. You went on Piers Morgan's show a couple right. of years ago on CNN, and he treated you like the dunce, and he put you in the corner and, and, <laughs> and made fun of you. Um, but you always, it, it's a complicated topic. There are uh, discussions of discrimination and is this bigotry or animus or what's animating your side of it. You always drag it back to this fundamental core question, what is marriage? What is it? Sort of the ontological question. So Ryan, share with our viewers, what is marriage? Sure, you know, if, if I was a smarter um, bookseller, I'd have a copy of my book right now to hold up for the camera, but uh, you're exactly right. The question, what is marriage, is the title that we gave uh, to the book that we wrote. I wrote a book with a classmate of mine from Princeton and with a professor of ours at Princeton um, titled, What is Marriage, Man and Woman, a Defense? And in that book, we make a philosophical and social science argument, a secular argument, no appeals to religion, no appeals to the Bible, because we think marriage has a nature uh, that based upon what human nature is, um, there's something known as marriage. And we have to think through what that something is. What is the nature of marriage based upon our embodiment as male and female? And so to give the shortest answer possible, we could say that marriage is really about uniting a man and a woman as husband and wife uh, so that any children that are the result of that union will be born within the context of a mother and father. That marriage is based on an anthropological truth that men and women are distinct and complementary it's based on a biological fact that reproduction requires a man and a woman, hmm. and it's based on a social reality that children deserve both a mother and a father. And so there's some simple truths here, anthropological, biological, and social truths that ultimately give rise to an institution, the institution of marriage. So this is not a uh, uh, marriage, you know, I suppose the other side wants to argue that marriage is a social construct. This is uh, a, a human creation. It's a, a social creation. And there's no need why we should be mired or stuck in the archaic, traditional, uh, patriarchal, oppressive past with this institution. That's their argument. How do you respond sure. to that? So even if you say that marriage is a social construct, you still have to say, for what ends, or what purpose are we constructing the institution of marriage? And how are we going to define marriage? So even if you think it's a social construct, that doesn't absolve you of the task of answering the question, well, what is marriage or what ought marriage to be? And those who want to redefine marriage ultimately just view marriage as an intense, emotional, romantic, caregiving union. Hmm. Uh, they say what makes marriage different than other types of friendship, other types of relationship, is the intensity, the priority, the amount of importance of the, the, um, the romance, the care, the commitment. But if that's the case, you collapse marriage into companionship writ large governed by contract law because hmm. there'll be no hmm. principled reason on this vision of marriage as a social construct of consenting adult romance and caregiving why marriage should be permanent why marriage should be exclusive why marriage should be monogamous 
consenting adult love, consenting adult caregiving can come in as many different sizes and shapes as consent comes in. Hmm. And so this alternative vision of marriage simply dissolves marriage into contract law. It could be between two people, three people, four people. It could be temporary or it could be permanent. It could be sexually open or it could be sexually exclusive. If all that marriage is is a social construct for consenting adult romance. Wow. Well, that leads me to the question then, Ryan. Why? So what? I mean, so what? Um, why can't the government just allow human relationships to, to be sort of the Wild West, where anybody can have any arrangement they want, and sure. uh, you know, it can be governed by contract law? What, I mean, what is the government's interest in regulating this in the first place? Sure. Uh, think about it this way. If marriage was simply about consenting adult romance, we could get the state out of your bedroom. We wouldn't need to have the government in the marriage business if marriage was simply about consenting adult love. If marriage is just about romance, the state has no interest in your love life. But marriage also is about creating the next generation and then uniting the next generation with the man and the woman who helped to create them. And so the reason that we have government in the marriage business is that the sexual union of a man and a woman can produce a child and children deserve to be raised by their mother and their father. And the way that you attach both a mom and a dad to a child is by attaching them to each other. Mm. You know, Maggie Gallagher is famous for saying that whenever a child is born, a, fa a mother is close by. You know, she's normally in the same room. <laughs> normally. <laughs> normally. That's a fact of biology. The question for culture, and so the question for law, is will a father be close by? And if so, for how long? Hmm. And the way that a political community maximizes the likelihood that that father is there is by getting him to commit both to the mother and to the child. And you do that with an institution called marriage. Well, that's fascinating. Well, then what about, Ryan? I'm, I'm sure you've never heard this question before. Okay, you've never heard this question before. <laughs> I'm about to blow your mind. Well, so people who can't have children can't, can't, ha can't enter into a marriage? Is that what you're saying? No, so that's not what we're saying. Um, there's a section in the book where we address that conclusion, uh, that, that objection. So I didn't surprise you with that question? We, 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 we have heard it before. Um, there are a couple of different ways of thinking about this. Um, one is to say that throughout the entirety of the common law tradition, the canon law practice, and our civil laws, infertility was never grounds for annulment, hmm. whereas impotency was. If you couldn't consummate a marriage, if you were impotent, that would be grounds for annulling a marriage, saying a marriage never actually took place. Hmm. Um, but simply because your marriage was never fruitful wasn't grounds for an annulment. And the idea here is that not every marriage will necessarily produce a child, but every child is the product of a union of a man and a woman. Hmm. So from the state's perspective, it, wanna rec it wants to recognize all marriages because the vast majority of them do result in children. And the way that you encourage men and women to commit to each other in marriage before they start reproducing is by upholding this ideal of what marriage is and that it's the appropriate uh, place for adult sexual relations. Hmm. Now you that, do it at the front end. You do it on the wholesale level, not on the retail level. Oh, that's an interesting way to put it. That is an interesting way to put it. Um, what are you guys doing about the argument of, or I guess it's not really a major argument right now, but I think it might become a major argument, of science. Now that we can genetically engineer our children, now that we still, I mean, there's, you still need the, the female and the male egg and sperm. But now that you have the ability to get that through donors or anybody else, we don't need marriage as a man and a woman only or as it stands now. You need caregivers, right? We, yeah, we have this other option with which to make children and have children. So how are you guys addressing the argument from that, you know, when it starts to relate to some of the scientific sure. progress in those areas? I mean, I think some of the technology here just makes um, the argument all that more important. Uh, and you can see this in uh, a nice report that the Institute for American Values put out titled, My Daddy's Name is Donor. Hmm. Um, we shouldn't kind of have a blase attitude towards anonymous sperm donation or the selling and the harvesting and then selling of human eggs. When I was at Princeton, the daily campus paper would have advertisements 
$50,000 to purchase the eggs from a Princeton undergrad, provided there were the right GPA, SAT, and uh, varsity sports teams. Wow. Um, surrogate wombs, you know, rent a wombs. Mm -hmm. we, should, we, we shouldn't be blasé about uh, the implications for human dignity and the sanctity of kind of uh, how we create new human life with some of these technologies. But the second point is, um, just because you could create a child with donor sperm or donor eggs or a surrogate womb doesn't mean you should, doesn't mean it's not committing an injustice to that child, um, nor does it mean that the child doesn't have a right to a relationship with both a mother and a father. Mm. Um, ideally, the mother and the father who helped create that child. Um, so I don't think science or technology um, changes kind of uh, um, the nature of the family or the nature of intergenerational relationships. Um, science and technology can be used either to enhance and elevate those relationships or to destroy and somewhat um, disfigure them. Hmm. Well, well, Ryan, uh, we're, we're reaching kind of a crunch point on this issue culturally, as you as you well know, the Supreme Court of the U.S. has agreed to take up the issue of same-sex marriage in this term. That's going to be argued, I believe, in April, and a decision will be handed yep. down uh, in early summer. So we are very quickly going to find out what Emperor Kennedy <laughs> says about these things. <laughs> I, my hopes are not real high. Uh, right. But... Uh, what about in in conservative and um, and evangelical circles and even Catholic circles? There's there's a big debate going on of what we do, and here are some some things that are said, and I want to try to gauge your response to them. Why can't we? Well, why can't we? And you've you've touched on this a little bit, but I'm going to ask it a little bit more pointedly. Why can't we just get the government out of the marriage business altogether? Right. <clears throat> if 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 marriage was like baptism or bar mitzvah, we could. If marriage was simply a religious institution, a sacrament or a covenant, um, then yeah, we don't have the state in the bar mitzvah business. We don't have the state in the baptism business. Hmm. Um, but marriage isn't simply a sacred institution. Um, so from a Christian perspective, if you know you're asking this from a Christian perspective, why don't we just get the state out of this? Before marriage becomes a religious institution, it's a natural institution. Mm. Um, so before we see kind of the um, the imagery of marriage as something between Christ and his church, before we see from a Catholic perspective, uh, marriage elevated as a sacrament, marriage is a natural institution. It's part of human nature. It's part of the order of creation. Um, and so just shifting to a policy perspective, that explains why government's in the marriage business. Government's not in the marriage business because of its sacred characteristics. Government's not in the marriage business because it's a sacrament or it's a covenant, something like that. Government's in the marriage business because the political community needs an institution to channel male, female, romantic desire in a stable, permanent, monogamous relationship. Because that male, female sexual desire can result in a child and that child has a right to a mother and a father. Mm -hmm. Those aren't religious considerations. Those aren't kind of holiness or sacramental or covenantal considerations. Those are natural realities. They're part of natural justice. And wow. that's really what the state uh, exists to promote and to defend uh, justice and the common good. So you're saying so that that's they, why I don't think we can separate marriage from from politics. You're saying See, they can't not <coughs> they can't not regulate this in some yeah. way, right? Yeah. No, no matter what. And the interesting thing that I, I you bring up is the fact that there's you've kind of undermined the whole even the whole kind of you know really prominent evangelical argument that look marriage is only sacred. It's only so therefore government should not have the right to this homosexuals should not have the right to this, but you're making a completely different argument by saying, no, actually the state is involved, the state is it. So we have to approach the, we have to approach the argument against same-sex marriage from a completely different angle. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, th th think about it this way. Um, 50 years ago, Moynihan issued his famous report, the Moynihan Report on the Black Family. And at the time, births to single mothers for Americans in general were in the single digits. Uh, but births to single mothers in the African-American community were approaching 25%. Mm. And Moynihan, you know, he was a Harvard professor. He was a Democrat appointee to a Democrat administration. He was a, 
uh, liberal senator from New York, his argument here was that this is really problematic for social justice reasons. Um, that the 25% of African American children who are being born to single mothers are going to have a tougher road ahead of them in life. Fast forward 50 years to today. Yeah, it's 80%, right? 40% of all Americans, 50% of Hispanics, and 73% of African Americans are born to single mothers. Think about the social justice implications here. What we know about the children born to single mothers increase odds of child poverty, decrease chances of social mobility, increase odds of committing crime, decrease probability of graduating high school, increase odds of spending time in jail, decrease probability of being in the paid workforce. Mm. So everything you could care about, if you care about um, social justice and the poor, and you care about limited government um, and freedom, because the other thing to mention is that we also see an increased welfare state and an mm. increased police state where the government tries to be the father in the form of the provider and the father in the form of the discipliner. Mm. Much better served with intact families. Wow. So if you get that father to commit to that mother and then you get the two of them to commit to each other with the child, then you can actually have a stable family life. The problem <coughs> with redefining marriage isn't that it caused this. Um, obviously, this problem has its own genesis. The problem of redefining marriage is that it enshrines a bad vision of marriage into the law. Mm. And it's the vision of consenting adult love is all that makes a marriage. Wow. Right? Yeah. And so once you enshrine that vision, you double down on all of the mistakes that got us to where we are today. And the law will now be teaching, more or less, that fathers are optional. Yeah. Because and then two moms or two dads, the same thing. Yeah, and then it, like it, you just you you know earlier in the in the discussion you kind of just you made that point saying if if it was just romantic romantic love, love right. the government would have no business <coughs> right. even needing to be involved right yeah well why can't yeah. we do this um, some 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 Christians are saying Ryan why you know we're we're fighting a losing battle here why don't Christians um, just c sort of concede the field. And we'll keep our sacred vision of marriage. We'll keep our religious idea of marriage. And we'll just let the state do what they're going to do. And we just won't participate um, in civil marriage. That, that's been an idea floated, um, you know, in even in the auspicious pages of First Things magazine, uh, which is was quite a shock. Um, what's your response to that? Can we just uh, sort of each you know, go off to our own realms and, and have two distinct visions of marriage in our culture. No, I mean, it, it's really, it, it's it's tragic, it's embarrassing, it's shameful, it's repulsive, it's all sorts of bad adjectives that First Things uh, issued that marriage pledge. Um, they did it without consulting anyone, they mm. did it without actually informing the editorial committee or the editorial board. It was a go-alone um, uh, attempt at this. But what it does is it abdicates responsibility for good citizenship. Um, the editors and the readers of First Things have an obligation to see that the law promotes the common good. And in saying we're just taking our ball and going home, we're, we're, we're pulling out um, from this discussion about what the law is going to say about marriage, we cease to witness to the truths, the truths that matter for justice and the common good that we need to see vindicated in public policy. Mm. So. My, my, my general uh, response to this is this is kind of like um, Bonhoeffer would call it cheap grace. Um, this is kind of a cheaply way of discipleship rather than actually saying we have to do the hard work of persuading our neighbors, explaining to our neighbors, educating our neighbors what marriage is, why marriage matters, hmm. and why the government shouldn't redefine marriage. And there will be bumps along the way. It won't be an easy lift. Um, but the task for the long haul is bearing witness to the truth about marriage as a natural institution, not solely as a sacred institution. Hmm. Uh, retreating hmm. to our own communities and saying, well, we'll just keep our community pure and pristine isn't sufficient if you want to be a good citizen. Part and of loving our neighbor has to entail caring about the laws that govern our common life together. And isn't it isn't it also naive, Ryan? thinking that you're, you're going to be left alone in your own little private community and your own little vision of marriage. <laughs> you know, um, Eric Erickson has this great phrase, you will be made to care. Yes. <laughs> and every day Eric Erickson has uh, proved uh, correct on this. It's naive to think that um, 
you will be left alone to tend to your own garden. If the flowers that you hope to be uh, uh, fostering, other people view as hatred and bigotry and the incarnation of evil itself. Yeah. Um, so we can't expect to have uh, religious liberty exemptions or religious liberty protections for a view that has been um, declared to be in and of itself an animus driven hated hatred hate filled view um so the task here really is to explain why we believe what we believe why it's good and true and noble and why we therefore should have the freedom to live by those convictions um but you can't do the latter piece the freedom to live by those convictions if you don't do the former piece yeah you know that's so great and it just it goes right back to the beginning of this whole conversation with you sitting around with a pint what better way to get into these long very potentially crazy discussions than over best over a, beer a pint <laughs> of guinness let me now you, you you don't know what's in this cup <laughs> <laughs> cheers i'm sure your enemies would probably say you are drunk right now that's right no doubt. You know, we should talk about some of our neighbors, yeah. our younger neighbors. Well, I was gonna, yeah, I was gonna say, and and that that leads us to, um, you know, kind of before we close, where it, this is all well and good, and there's a lot of people that really believe and really want to get involved in this, but we seem to be losing the argument to some extent with millennials in particular. You know, I, I read a recent statistic that the, you know, that's only like three or four percent of the entire population of the United States is homosexual. Therefore, how do they get so much push for their agenda behind them being such a small a small Segment, part yeah. of our of our of our nation <coughs> and a lot of that push is coming from the millennial demographic. So how would you how would you suggest we we, we reach sure. out to these millennials and kind of frame this conversation? I mean, the, the starting point is say it's not surprising at all uh, that millennials believe what they do believe about marriage. Um, this is a generation that came of age in a culture that is largely um, incoherent and confused about the nature of human sexuality and the nature of the family. It's only after two generations of the sexual revolution and of the hookup culture, of extramarital sex, of no-fault divorce, of high rates of divorce, of non-marital childbearing, the rise of absentee fathers, the pornography epidemic, only after all of that does the legal redefinition of marriage seem plausible? Hmm. Only after you've already made a mess of marriage. And let me stress again, this isn't to say that somehow gays and lesbians are to blame for this. It's just right. that redefining marriage is the logical conclusion of all of the rest that came first. But if you think <coughs> all of that that came first, those were bad steps, steps in the wrong direction. They were misguided uh, revolutionaries that came out of the sexual revolution. Why would you want to double down on those mistakes with the legal redefinition of marriage? So it's not surprising that millennials are confused about this. The task for all of us is to bring um, clarity. It's to help think through the nature of uh, human embodiment as male and female, the nature of the family, the nature of marriage. And here I just think we take our cue from uh, the pro-life movement. Uh, 42 years ago, we got the Roe v. Wade decision. And when you looked at demographics in the years after that, all of the elite opinion writers were saying, look, the pro-life movement has lost. All of the young people are pro-choice. Mm. Um, the majority of Americans, I think at one point it was somewhere around 66, 67, two thirds of all Americans were pro-choice. The vast majority of the young people at the time, they were saying that the last pro-lifers on earth will be in nursing homes and inside of the Vatican. <laughs> but what happened? You know, last week, right here in D.C., we had the 42nd annual March for Life. <coughs> there were over 600,000 people here in D.C. marching to the Supreme Court, and the vast majority of them were millennials. My generation is more pro-life than my parents' generation. Wow. And, and how did this take place? It's that my parents' generation did the hard work of explaining the facts about embryology, of explaining the dignity of unborn human life, explaining the legal principles of why Roe v. Wade was bad constitutional law, explaining the moral principle of what we owe to our unborn neighbor, um, establishing all of the pregnancy centers that actually supply concrete love and care and assistance to women and to children. And all of that work 
over 40 years bore fruit. And it bore fruit in the 600,000 people marching last week in D.C., most of whom were in their teens, 20s, and 30s. Wow. There's no reason to think that this can't happen on the marriage issue. It just needs to, to have a number of people devote their work towards educating and witnessing to the truth about human nature, human sexuality, and the family. And, and, and it seems to me not get discouraged because based on what you just said, we're talking about 40 years here. We're talking about a generation. And it's so easy to, when we, when we suffer defeats, whether it's by a federal <coughs> judge, you know, striking down a, 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 a referendum or whatever, it's so easy to throw up the hands and get right back into where we just were talking about, well, maybe we'll take our ball and go home. So right. um, I, I admire you. The important you. thing is not to lose hope. Yeah, and I admire you, Ryan. Uh, you certainly have have entered the arena. You have suffered the slings and the arrows, um, but you doggedly uh, keep on keeping on on this issue. And it's really helpful to to me. It's helpful to to our viewers and everybody else to see your example uh, in your tireless efforts. So we really do appreciate uh, your work. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Thanks for coming on, Ryan. And if you would like sure to follow Ryan, Ryan, how can people follow you, interact with you, get in touch with you? Sure. Uh, I'm on Twitter. I think it's um, Ryan T underline Anderson or Ryan T underscore Anderson on Twitter. If you just uh, go to the Heritage Foundation, do a Google search for Ryan Anderson Heritage Foundation. The first hit on Google is my bio page there. It lists all the papers I've written, blog posts, interviews. This video at some point will be linked on that bio page as well. So... Just do a, a Google search for my name and the Heritage Foundation. And and we would be remiss to not uh, remind you that uh, Ryan's book, which he uh, co-authored yep. with two others, What is Marriage, is um, is ammunition you simply must have. So uh, go to Amazon or wherever books are sold and pick up What is Marriage. Fantastic. And to follow us at Dead Reckoning, I'm Jay Friesen on Twitter, J-A-Y-F-R-I-E-S-E-N. I'm at Brian G. Matson, And you can follow our Twitter account as well, D-Reckoning TV. We're on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. Share <coughs> us with your friends. Tell everybody you know about us. Follow the Heritage Foundation. Interact with these guys. They're a great, great organization. With that, thanks for joining us on Above the Pay Grade. Brand new first episode of season five. And we look forward to being with you all spring in through the early summer. I'm Jay Friesen. I'm Brian Matson, And this is Dead Reckoning.